¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? ¿No? ¿Me oyen? Sí, se escucha. Eh, voy a eliminar la... Si me permiten, voy a... Este, eliminar el, el video para que no haya... Okay, so today I'm going to continue with the uh, the technique of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, <clears throat> or also known as electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. And uh, let me use the pen here. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I just want to mention that we have a new uh, the people that are funding our research. Uh, we have FREM, as we mentioned yesterday, that is part of uh, the collaboration with CHESS. And we have SIREN, they say an NSF center also in CREST, Center for Interfacha, and the Center for Innovation Research uh, in Environmental Nanotechnology. And we just recently, uh, I think last week, we got the notice of a award of a new center called Scholar Partnership in Nuclear Security. And this was uh, Alabama a and is the lead. And we will be participating with this center in uh, collaboration with three uh, national labs, Savannah River National Lab, Brookhaven, and Los Alamos. And also a uh, Navajo University, Navajo Technical University. And we're very excited about this new center because it's in the new area of uh, uh, nuclear security and safety and sensing. Uh, so I, <clears throat> yesterday I gave you some references for for the course, uh, and here some of them are are <clears throat> are from yesterday. But I would like to mention this new edition, 2020, uh, from John Watts. Uh, it's an introduction to surface analysis by XPS and, and uh, OJ electron spectroscopy, which is a very the first edition was a very good book. I don't have the second edition, but it must be. Uh, better and John Watt uh, also uh, Watts <clears throat> uh, wrote a small uh, book uh, that is from Oxford Press. Uh, it's very um, uh, sometimes it's difficult to find it, but you might find it used. And it's a small a small book uh, that appears here to your left. It's called the Introduction to Surface Analysis by Electron Spectroscopy. So it talks about uh, OJE and uh, XPS. And it's very, very nice uh, uh, pocketbook that you might like to have. And this is a new edition of the surface analysis for XPS by XPS and OJ by, by Watson. Uh, Wolsten, I'm, I'm not sure if I pronounced right. Uh, Wolsten Holmes. Uh, so it might be a, be a nice uh, edition. Anyway, so yesterday we, uh, so I'm gonna I I gave you a, a brief history and uh, I'm gonna talk about the instrumentation and some spectra, spectral analysis and applications. As I mentioned yesterday, you can work in uh, ultra, ultraviolet with an ultraviolet source. Uh, it's the ultraviolet uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, they, they call it. And uh, usually you're looking at balanced band uh, electrons, electrons that are more exposed. Uh, of uh, from the atoms and, and bonds and molecules. But what we're gonna be talking is uh, X-rays. Uh, uh, so it will be X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So we're gonna be working with X-ray sources. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, this is a very uh, basic principle of what happens uh, for this technique. You have a, an X-ray source and has the enough energy to remove an internal um, electron. In this case, the uh, level 1s uh, <clears throat> for oxygen, uh, uh, for example. And then you can have some transition, electron transition from the uh, level 2p to the uh, level s. And in that transition, two things may, may occur, x-ray emission, and that's x-ray fluorescence, or you will have a second electron coming out which is an OJ electron, <clears throat> which only depends on, on this energy, <clears throat> this change in energy. So it doesn't, this electron doesn't depend on the energy of the photon. 
However, you need a, uh, enough energy to remove this electron. So, oops, so that you, uh, so that you have uh, uh, this Oye electron coming out. And we will probably uh, uh, talk about Oye tomorrow or later today if we have, uh, if we have time. So uh, <clears throat> the basic apparatus for this thing, and we will go over it uh, later, is that you have an X-ray source. Uh, uh, it hits the sample, and as I told you yesterday, the sample should be uh, connected to ground, because if not, you will have uh, charging at the surface, because electrons are coming out, and that affects the uh, 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 Col Columbic forces and it might affect the kinetic energy of the electron coming out from the surface. And you have distortion on your spectrum. And then in this, this so the two important parts of the uh, XPS is the electron analyzer and the uh, X-ray source. <clears throat> and obviously the sample that you're analyzing in your system. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned yesterday, sorry, is that all of this uh, has to be in a UHB. As we mentioned yesterday, we talked about va va vacuum, and it has to be under UHP conditions, ultra high vacuum conditions. Since you want the electron that is coming out from the sample uh, to, <clears throat> for it to not lose any kinetic energy, uh, because you, you want to analyze exactly the kinetic energy of the electron that's coming out from the surface. <clears throat> And as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, one of the uh, or that described uh, the initial application of XPS was uh, Kai Sigman, uh, because he uh, he presented a spectra of this molecule uh, looking at the carbon one s carbon one s uh, electron. Hello. Any questions? No. So <clears throat> you, will, you will expect that you will have only one energy for the electron from the 1s level, but he found out that you had four different energies. And those four different energies uh, were due to the, to the atom that was bonded to the carbon. So you, here you have hydrogen, and here you have fluor that is more electron negative. So it will attract the uh, electronic um, cloud of the carbon so having, this will have like a positive uh, charge, the carbon. So it would be like, I mean, so it would be more difficult to remove another electron because you will convert it to a, a, a higher positive charge when you remove the uh, electron from the 1s. So it's more difficult to get this electron out. This one is much easier. So uh, the binding energy is reflected uh, on that. So this is uh, lower binding energy. You can see it here. And this one is the highest binding energy. Oops, and it's up here. So you have two types of uh, ways to do this. You can plot against binding energy or kinetic energy of the electron, but it's the most common one is binding energy. I will show you later on some, some spectra that they plotted uh, with respect to kinetic energy. And as I told you yesterday, so the, uh, the binding energy, uh, the binding energy will be equal to, uh, more or less equal to the energy of the source, H nu, minus the uh, kinetic energy that you determine for the electron. And there's another, you know, phi, that is the work function and other parameters that you have to correct for. But the main part is this part, where is the kinetic energy with the uh, energy of the source. So in, <clears throat> although uh, Kai Sigman was the one that developed this, uh, or demonstrate the capability of uh, XPS uh, in the 50s and 60s, there was a more, a, a previous paper in 1951, uh, which they uh, presented the X-ray photoelectric spect spectrometer for chemical analysis. But as I mentioned yesterday, they were analyzing metals. So, uh, so they were analyzing different metals. 
and uh, the paper was uh, really good, but I think that the one that demonstrated uh, the applicability for uh, functional groups and doing more chemistry identification uh, was Kai Sigman. And, and he won actually the Nobel Prize of Physics in 1981. I, talk, I talked to about this yesterday too. You need to, uh, this is a, a they call the universal curve. Um, and it comes up now and then. It's basically an indication of what is the distance. So it's the mean free path. Usually it's uh, expressed as, as lambda. It's how, uh, how much an electron can move inside a solid without losing energy. Uh, kinetic energy. And here, obviously, they have different metals and they're plotting the, uh, the distance, the depth, the electron can move uh, without losing energy. So usually in XPS, you work in this region. So that's more or less the region that, that you work in XPS. So we're talking about probably from uh, six angstroms to uh, up to probably 11, uh, uh, 11 um, or uh, 20 uh, angstroms, that would be like two nanometers. So you, you have up to like two nanometers uh, of analysis. And obviously this one, these electrons from this, that are you looking for these uh, elements, they will lose the energy if they think, I mean, if they, they have a, a, a deeper analysis. So only the ones that come out from the five to six nanometer angstroms, they will not lose energy. Uh, so uh, there is a difference in these two. And we mentioned that when we uh, analyze or try to determine the concentration of elements in a sample, uh, you would like to look at peaks that are very close in lambda and uh, basically very close in energy so that the lambda is the same and because lambda is a parameter in the uh, in the analysis that we will see later on we talked about this yesterday too that uh, basically you have uh, this is the 1s uh, uh, for example 1s uh, one half level the k level and if you have an electron uh, that uh, will go or is excited with photons and it will go all the way to vacuum, uh, <clears throat> there is a work function. Uh, it's like the ionization potential for the electron to leave the atom. And then it will come with the excess uh, will be kinetic energy. Remember that you are exciting the, uh, the atom with, uh, x-rays um, and the excess of energy will be kinetic energy. What happens here is that the uh, work function for the spectrometer and the sample might be different and you have to correct for that because if you just analyze the kinetic energy without correcting as you would as you see here the work function is uh, larger so the kinetic energy that you're measuring at the end will be smaller than the real one. And the spectra will be at another binding energy. So you need to use a standard. Usually they use uh, gold 4F, uh, looking at gold 4F electrons. Uh, and they also use carbon, since most of the samples that you analyze are exposed to air, they will have a very small uh, film of carbon on the surface. And it's uh, usually used as a reference to the carbon one S. This is basically the same thing we talked yesterday. I talked about this too, that there are other parameters that are involved that, that you have to take in consideration. I mean, this ones, but the most important one is uh, the energy of the source and the binding energy. So all these parameters you will basically we say standard you can correct for. We also mentioned uh, about the, uh, the uh, different uh, orbitals and the, uh, the spin orbit 
uh, splitting parameters, uh, J. For example, you will see only one peak for, for an S orbital, but for a P you will see two, and for a D you will see two, and for F you will see two. That is if the uh, electron analyzer has the enough resolution to see the two of them. If the energies are pretty close, maybe you will see one. But this is pretty easy to identify if it's an S orbital or D, P, D, and F. And also the ratio of the peaks will let you know uh, which orbital is, if it's P, D, or F. If you say P, you will have two peaks and the ratio is one to two. D will be two to three and F will be three to four. And that's really a, a, um, a fingerprint that you can use to identify the orbitals that are being analyzed uh, in the spectra. And the number of electrons can be determined by 2j plus one for each of the uh, levels. Each atom has a uh, different uh, cross section. Cross section is uh, sort of, uh, I think I put it here, no. Cross section is a, uh, it's sort, of, it's sort of like the probability, depending on how many photons reach your sample and how many ele photoelectrons are coming out, that will be your cross section. If you get more electrons out with the same energy or number of photons, uh, your cross section is higher. So the point here is that the cross section for the different levels are shown here as a function of uh, the atomic number so it's a different elements have different cross sections. And this is uh, this uh, graph or data is for a aluminum K alpha X-ray source. So this is another parameter. So now I, I mentioned Lambda is a parameter that you need to know uh, more or less. I mean, the depth of the electron that you are analyzing, if you're gonna try to determine concentration. And the other one is the cross section and you choose like Sigma. So the cross section is another parameter that, that is different for different elements and different uh, uh, energy levels. And you have to take that into consideration at the end. So it's another parameter. So for example, if you take uh, zinc, uh, calcium and zinc, and you look at the three P one half, three P three halves, this appears like here the value for calcium for zinc is up here. So that's probably uh, a factor of 10 in intensity for zinc compared to calcium. And that's a huge change. So that, that meaning that under the same conditions and probably the same concentrations of calcium and zinc, the uh, zinc peak will be higher in intensity compared to calcium. So when you see the spectra, uh, and you see that a peak is higher than for another element, uh, that doesn't mean that you have more concentration. And so you have to be very careful. You might, it's misleading. Um, uh, cross section might be a factor and obviously lambda, depending on the energy, as I mentioned, uh, the kinetic energy that you're analyzing, if it's higher kinetic energy, you will have more signal because you're looking at uh, deeper from your sample. If it's uh, energy is lower than it's a smaller uh, distance uh, uh, depth of analysis. So those are two parameters that you need to, to be sure that uh, have an idea. No? The textbook uh, that, I, uh, that I mentioned before, let's see, oh, here the handbook. The handbook has like a sensitivity factor for each element. So you might use that but each instrument has their own sensitivity factor for, for each element and they take in consideration uh, these two parameters for the sensitivity factor. So it's sort of like a semi-quantitative analysis. The other thing that you have to, <clears throat> to take in consideration is that the peak width depends on, on several factors. Uh, so how, what's the full width of maxima? You know, you sort of, you have like a Gaussian distribution and this is energy, binding energy. Uh, 
before we have max is just at the half of the peak, the width is what is called full width of maxima. This full width of maxima will depend on, on three main parameters. And one is the natural inherent width of the uh, transition of the level that you are analyzing. It was basically a natural uh, width. Then the, uh, the other ones that you can do, so this one you cannot do anything about it because I mean, it's natural for the element and the level that you're looking at. But there are two that you have to, that you can work with. And one is the source. So you want an X-ray source that has a, full, a very small full width of maxima of the emission. So it's very narrow uh, energy distribution. And also the analyzer, you want to, it to have a, that can resolve the energies, kinetic energies as much as possible. So, uh, so these two parameters are, are the ones that are, are the ones that you can control. So you get a better X-ray source and a better analyzer, you can improve the uh, full width of maximum of your spectra. Usually uh, the shape is a Gaussian shape, but it has also a Lorentzian uh, factor, but in general it's usually Gaussian shape uh, distribution. Uh, this is the information of the uh, inherent uh, uh, the delta E that I mentioned initially. And it's <clears throat> one of the things that has to take in consideration is the lifetime of the hole. After you remove a, a core level electron, how much it will take, and that affects the delta E. Uh, and for example, depending on the on these two core levels, this is for uh, 3s of silver or 3d of, of silver, the lifetime is different. And having different lifetimes will affect the uh, the delta E uh, that I mentioned here, that it's the uh, the first delta E, natural inherent uh, of the um, of the element and level that you are analyzing. Uh, And the other, when you do uh, the photo emission, uh, uh, the photo electrons coming out, you will have uh, X-ray fluorescence and Oye, and this might affect a little bit also the delta E. I mean, in Oye, remember Oye, you have a element uh, that is zero, but then you uh, remove uh, one electron, it's positive one, and then you remove, uh, if you do an Oye transition, you are going to uh, second charge. So it's highly charged actually. And this affects the, uh, the kinetic energy as well of the, uh, of the electrons coming out. So those are sort of parameters that affect uh, are inherent in the, uh, in the delta E. I uh, included this, this is a booklet uh, that you can uh, download from uh, Berkeley lab. Uh, and you can get the uh, uh, periodic table, and each periodic table has a different element, and and you can click on the element. For example, you have here silver, uh, and it will give you the binding energy of all the uh, electrons uh, level. For for example, for K, uh, for the uh, 1s level is 25,514 electron volts, which is quite high. And uh, the the uh, more external level N3 or 4P3 half is 58 electron volts. Yesterday I mentioned that the difference in energy between the first level and second level is really huge. And here you can see this example, this is 25 and this is 3000. Uh, so it's like 20, 20 kV, uh, 20,000 kV. Uh, of uh, difference between those two levels. Then the second level and the third is probably 3,000 and here it's like 100, 100 and here's much less. So so uh, sometimes you see those levels uh, distribution in in your textbooks and the there's misleading. So just to be just yes, to understand that the difference between level one and level two is huge for all the elements. And especially for silver, it's like 20K. Uh, 
Okay, it's kilo, kilo electron volts. The good thing of that uh, table is also gives you the uh, the fluorescence transition, the alphas, the betas, and all the energies uh, of each of the transitions that you can see by uh, <coughs> uh, through X-ray fluorescence. So, for example, this I showed yesterday is a spectra for for silver, uh, the silver spectra. A, uh, and you can see here that this is plot against the binding energy and the lower one is in kinetic energy. And you see here some that we will talk this later on today or tomorrow. And uh, this is an OJ, uh, OJ electrons. And here you have the 4D, 4P. They should be two peaks, but the resolution is not good enough and they appear as one, and then you have the 4s. This is amplified four times, and then you have the 3d that is uh, three fourths, as I mentioned before, and uh, the 2p uh, that is one half. So this is twice the area of this one, and then you have the 3s that is only one. And if you go to the uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, web page and click on silver. This is what you get, and you can see that here is the uh, M4 is 3D 5 half and 3D 3 half is 374, 368. And uh, it, uh, let's see, this is, let's start with the uh, S. So this should be, uh, did I put this right? Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> I was getting confused. You don't see this uh, L1 and L2 and L3 because they are over 3,000 electron volts. And, and usually the source that you use is in the range of one to two kilo electron volts. So you're not able to, uh, to uh, remove an internal electron to see this. Uh, you're not able to remove these electrons. The only ones that you see are this one and this is uh, 3S is 790, 719, and here is 3S, and this is uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. So this is 700. So that's where it comes. And you see the dividing energy exactly what the what the table says. And then you have the 600, that's uh, this is the 573 and 603 for 3P three half and 3P one half. And they're exactly where they are. And then you have uh, the 3D, 3D three halves and 3D five halves, 374 and 368. And they basically, these are 100, 200, 300. So it appears where it has to appear. So uh, then you have the other ones that are sort of uh, very small energy. That's the 4S. 4p one half and 4p three half. This is 58 electron volts, 63 electron. So they're very close to zero. And zero is sort of like the Fermi level of your system. Um, so this area here that is close to zero, uh, binding energy, usually they use the ultraviolet UPS, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy to characterize this better. And uh, you get a lot of information for molecules, for example, on the bondings uh, of the molecule. And I'll show you some spectra of polymers. And for polymers, they use this area as a fingerprint to identify polymers. So uh, this is close to the balance band, so growing the balance band. So again, it's everything is there, this uh, uh, quantized, uh, structure and levels and that's the values that that you see you cannot see these values as i mentioned this one and this one because the source that you are using doesn't uh, doesn't have enough energy to excite those electrons and so you're not going to be able to see it if you go to a synchrotron uh, depending on the energy 
uh, usually you can go, uh, some of them can go up to 50,000 kilo electron volts. So you will be able to see the four of them. Uh, so obviously see, this is the kinetic energy. This is the binding energy. If you use 50,000 electron volts, the difference will be 25,000 electron volts. Yeah, is that right? That would be the kinetic energy. So if you go back to the uh, universal curve, you will be up, up in this area. So the depth of analysis is longer, uh, larger, because you're gonna see these uh, electrons by XPS, but it's gonna analyze uh, deeper into, uh, into the, uh, your sample. And Brookhaven, they have, a, uh, uh, they have a, a beam line for XPS analysis. Uh, it's from the uh, NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology. They have a dedicated uh, uh, beam line for XPS. And uh, if you look at higher energies, then you're looking at uh, deeper analysis. The other important thing of, uh, of uh, this is another example of nickel. Again, it's the same thing. Uh, here you have uh, the, uh, the nickel uh, L1 is at the thousand, the 2S, and here's the 2S. You have the 870 and 852, 42 P levels, and they're basically here in the, uh, between uh, 850 and 900. And then you have uh, the uh, uh, closer to the balance band. Uh, the 3S is at 110, it's here. And 68 and 66 for M2 and M3, they are together here. You cannot resolve them. And here is zero. This is the uh, Fermi level. And then this uh, that I mentioned before, usually you have a carbon signal. This, this uh, surface was not clean uh, enough and you see a peak and this peak sometimes is taken as a reference. Uh, so this I don't think was corrected actually because it's too, uh, too, 50, too 50, so maybe it's not corrected. It's, it's pretty close to 300. So that's why probably you see this because this is a sort of the external levels. Oops, it should be closer to zero. Anyway, so the other thing that you see is that you can see uh, the uh, OJ lines and then you see, uh, and that's uh, basically uh, for this magnesium K alpha. I told you that if you use an aluminum uh, K alpha source and you do the spectra and plot it against binding energy, all these peaks are gonna appear in the binding energy that they are, they are known to be according to this table. But the uh, OJ line, it's gonna move because uh, uh, the OJ lines doesn't depend on the energy of the source. It depends on the transition, uh, internal transition. So <clears throat> the good thing to have what is called a dual anode source to have a K alpha, magnesium K alpha and aluminum K alpha source is that you can change the, uh, the X-ray source and you will see this, if you see a peak moving it's definitely it's an OJ line. So it's a very easy way to, to identify OJ transitions and not get confused. So, so that's the advantage of having a, what is called a dual anode source. Aluminum, I have the values back later. Let's see. Let me go ahead at on time. For example, aluminum, it's uh, 14, 1,486 ele electron volts, and magnesium is, uh, it's uh, 200, 1,253. So there's a difference like 200 electron volts. So, so the aluminum uh, is 1,400, is that right? Yeah, aluminum is higher, 200 uh, electron volts higher. So if you look at this peak, 
and this is with magnesium, if you go to aluminum, what you will what do you think will happen to the OJ lines? In what direction it will move? Somebody can tell me. Remember, this is like 1.4 kilo electron volt. So it's like 200 electrons volt higher. That means that <clears throat> the kinetic energy of these OJ lines are not going to change. But you're going to make the, uh, the analysis with this energy. So the kinetic energy of this is the same. It's not going to change of these electrons if you are with magnesium or aluminum. So if you, but then you, when you do the calculation, because you're an XPS instrument, it will appear that it has what? A higher binding energy or a lower binding energy? Somebody can answer? <clears throat> Students? Is it a lower binding energy? If it's a lower binding energy, it will have, yes. It will have a higher kinetic energy because the binding energy is the same for this one, no? I mean, the transition is the same. So it will have a, a, a lower binding energy. It will have a higher kinetic energy. The electrons coming out. It will assume that it's higher kinetic energy. <clears throat> the kinetic energy is the same, but you're comparing with that, uh, yeah. You have a, a lower binding energy. So, uh, for example, you will calculate uh, the binding energy. This will, this will be, hold on. Oops. <laughs> so the, in one is one point, uh, one, let me, let me do this here. Uh, okay. I don't know how to erase actually. Okay, so let's determine here the binding energy. So if you have a binding energy here and you uh, use this, let's put this 1.2 kilo electron volts. And minus E is kinetic of of the uh, OJ electron and the other one is 1.4 and this is kilo electron volts minus the same value so what you will get if this is the same and this is higher the binding energy is higher so you will have a binding energy that is higher, not lower. So this difference will be higher than this one. So you'll have a higher binding energy. So meaning that these peaks will move in this direction. <clears throat> so if they moved in that direction, then that means that they, uh, they are all yeah. Okay. So they're gonna go higher for aluminum than for magnesium than for um, magnesium, yeah. Yeah, because the magnesium is 1.2 and aluminum is 1.4. The kinetic energy of the OJ is constant because it depends only on on this transition. For example, this so this OJ depends on this transition. So this energy is used to remove this all electron out. I mean, the, this transition, this energy difference is used to remove this electron. So the kinetic energy of this uh, OJ electron is the same. It doesn't depend on the energy of the photon. So the kinetic energy is based on this transition. So that's not gonna change. But when you go to the XPS instrument, they do the calculation, you know, anyway. And the kinetic energy is the same. The two, I mean, for the two analysis, the only thing that is changing is the uh, source. So this is higher difference than this one. So this will, you will have a higher binding energy. So this will move in this direction. 
Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so this one I'm not, I'm not gonna ch I'm not gonna change because the kinetic energy is not gonna be the same. If you use a uh, higher binding energy, I mean higher source, higher will be the kinetic energy because the binding energy is the same. So they calculate this and it appears where it has to appear. So, este, so uh, again, I, but if for example, but if you plot this versus kinetic energy. Which peaks are going to change? Because we have that versus binding energy. But you can plot it against kinetic energy. So in this case, which if you plot it against kinetic energy and you do it with magnesium, right? and then with aluminum source, aluminum is 1.4. Uh, kilo electron volts and magnesium is 1.2 kilo electron volts. Which one? What will happen? The kinetic energy of the OJ is constant, so the OJ are not going to change. In this case, if you plot it versus kinetic energy, the XPS peaks are going to change because the kinetic energy is going to be higher if you use aluminum. So if you plot it against binding energy, the OJ move. If you plot it against kinetic energy, the XPS moves. So, uh, so that's a very simple way to, uh, to identify peaks and be sure that are XPS peaks or OJ peaks. I mentioned this yesterday and include this slide. Uh, the electrons, uh, so uh, <clears throat> what you see here, I mentioned this yesterday. This is sort of the background signal. And when you see here uh, electrons coming out, you have this increase in background. And the same thing happens here. The background increases. And this area here, this increase in uh, background, these are electrons. These are electrons of the, uh, these are really OJ electrons that lost energy because they were coming from deeper than they are allowed in order to not lose energy, kinetic energy. So these are OJ electrons. And this difference here that you see here are uh, the 2P electrons that lost energy from nickel. So, uh, so that's basically what it says here. These are the main peak. This one didn't lose energy, but if you lose energy, you have an uh, inelastic scattering tail and you will have an increase in the, uh, in the background because they are coming from deeper. And if they can't, I mean, X-rays can penetrate uh, a thousand angstroms or more, and you will have uh, OJ electrons up here, XPS electrons down here, but they are not able to come out because they're too deep. But if they are close to the surface, maybe they have collisions and they lose energy. If they don't have collisions, you're gonna exactly determine their kinetic energy. But the ones that have collisions is the background one. And since the collisions are different for all the electrons, you don't see a peak. You basically see a background. This is like a ocean of electrons with different kinetic energies because of the collisions, you see? Uh, this is a uh, an example of silicon. Again, this is the binding energy for the 2P. You should have two peaks, but the resolution is not good enough to separate them. So you have two peaks here, 2P one half and 2P three halves. And when you have an oxide, basically it moves to a higher binding energy. And this is a big, big change. I mean, it's uh, like, more than like four electron volts and four electron volt, volts of uh, change is huge in XPS. I mean, it's, and it's very easily seen. Uh, and here again is the data from the table from uh, Lawrence Berkeley. And here the, uh, the 2S is in, uh, this is 2S. So it's, this, it's an average of these two. 
So it's around 90, uh, 99.6. So this is, uh, this is 98, 99. So it's basically 99.15. And it was, when it's uh, oxidized, it's 103. So it moved to a higher binding energy. And there is a, uh, this is an example of, uh, of uh, how deep you can see things in XPS. Uh, for example, if you, uh, if you have a plain or clean uh, silicon surface, or silicon wafer, basically you only see one peak for the 2P. But when you start to make an oxide, very small oxide, it's like seven less, much, much less than 7.5 nanometers, you start to see uh, an additional peak. You see the oxide and the peak for the silicon is lower because you have this barrier. And as you increase the oxide, this peak starts to decrease more compared to this one. And when you get to 7.5 nanometers, basically it's almost disappeared. And we have more, when you have uh, 10 nanometers of thickness of silicon oxide, you don't see the uh, silicon zero. You only see the oxide. So this is uh, a way to, uh, to analyze surface. It's a very surf surface sensitive technique. Um, and you can see that very easily. And you can determine the thickness of the uh, samples. I mean, of the oxides, for example. You can do it uh, differently. You can do it uh, by changing the angle of detection. Uh, so your analyzer is here to detect the kinetic energy of the, of the electron. So depending on the angle, you will see more the surface or less surface. So uh, here, if you, if you put this at 90 degrees, it's sort of like in this direction. So the penetration is uh, uh, it's, uh, deeper. If you put it in this direction, then this distance is the same distance as this one. Oops, as this one. So um, here you will see deeper and you will see mainly silicon and not the oxide. So meaning that if you decrease the angle, you see this silicon oxide since you don't see it at 90 degrees, I mean, it means that it's a very thin silicon oxide layer on silicon. So in order to enhance the surface, you can just change the angle and that will, will really help you analyze better the sample. Many, uh, you can also do uh, an, an angle resolved. Uh, so it's called angle resolved uh, XPS and do it at different angles to study the uh, surface of your sample. So a takeoff angle is, uh, it's sort of uh, uh, important. And the chemical shift, it's uh, known uh, by theory that with the former oxidation state, uh, you can change it up to six, um, with six, uh, charge of six, you will move uh, probably like a shift of five electron volts. So you have a very nice shift in, in the silicon uh, sulfur chemi chemical uh, shift for the 1S. And uh, here the, uh, the binding energy, basically it's in binding energy. And you see how it changes with the calculated charge on, this, on the sulfur. So there is a linear relationship between basically the charge and the change in chemical shifts. Here's an example from the literature from the accounts on chemical research. Uh, uh, these are dendromers uh, that have so sodium and, and sulfur and uh, depending on the, uh, the structure, the structural unit, the sulfur 2P changes, you can see it here. And uh, depending on, on that, you can determine the, the binding energy of silicon, it would be uh, quite different because of the uh, elements that are around, uh, in this case, silicon. It, uh, you, I said sulfur, it's silicon, sorry. <laughs> I saw the S is silicon. Be sure I'm talking about silicon, yeah. So, so that's another way to look at uh, the, um, at uh, the uh, uh, 
and your uh, materials. So, so here, for example, you have a binding area, you have uh, silicon 2P and silicon 2P. So you have two type of silicons in this uh, structure. And uh, sodium has also, um, sorry, you can see sodium here, and you can see aluminum, but the silicon peak changes enor enormously. It's a, a huge difference in electron, uh, electron bulk change, the chemical shift. And here you can see the shift in the uh, aluminum 2P and sodium 2, 2S. Uh, so the silicon is the one that ch changes the most, but also sodium 2S and sodium aluminum 2P also changes uh, the binding energy. So, uh, so that's a very uh, useful way to look at structure, chemical shift and chemical structure. And here this is a, uh, an old table from an instrumental analysis textbook that shows you how, how, depending on the oxidation state, how much the binding energy uh, uh, changes. In this case, you have sulfur and it changes like five electron volts. Uh, and, uh, and nitrogen here, eight electron volts. Uh, so it's a big, uh, a big change. And if you look at the carbon 1S signal and the oxygen 1S signal, uh, although the changes are very uh, small, but you can see changes in the 1S structure. Usually this, uh, this is the standard value. This changes uh, from uh, <clears throat> scientist to scientist. It's, sometimes it's 284.5, 284.8 or 285. And this is what I mentioned previously that you use as a reference because most of the samples have uh, hydrocarbons uh, on the surface. And you can use that as, an ex as a reference value to calibrate the X axis, the binding energy axis. But here you, you can see that as the, uh, el <clears throat> as the atom is more electronegative, the one that, go, that is binded to binding to carbon, then the binding energy increases. And it's a very easy way to, to look at structures uh, or corro corroborate structures of your material. The same is true with the oxygen 1S signal. It, the difference is not as, as, as high as the carbon 1S, but the oxygen 1S also changes depending on what is, bi what is binding to the uh, oxygen. So you can uh, look at that very easily. Here is a, uh, so also from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, laboratory database and uh, this for for example for the nitrogen 1s if we put this as a reference as just zero how much as a uh, magnitude how much it changes so it changes around seven electron volts uh, nitrogen oxide will be seven electron volts higher than ammonia and that's huge change and the carbon here is uh, around 11 electron volt that I showed you before, this for xenon. But again, you have all this uh, information available. Uh, if you're gonna do, uh, I mean, you're doing an analysis and you want to look at some data and be sure trying to identify what functional group you have on your surface, you can go to databases that are really available. At, uh, in addition to the handbook that I mentioned previously, in Lawrence Berkeley, they have different, for different elements. Uh, I mentioned this before, so um, of the background. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna talk now about, uh, about the uh, instrumentation. Uh, and <clears throat> is there any questions? I'm gonna change gears to instrumentation now. Any questions about the spectra? spectra? Okay, so, <clears throat> so there are uh, several things that you would like to uh, 
to uh, know about the, the instrument, basically you need to have an X-ray source. And here you have an X-ray source here. And you need to have an electron analyzer, which is what you have here. <clears throat> so those are the two mo most important uh, um, parts of the uh, XPS instrument. In this image that you have here, you have a UV lamp. Uh, so this instrument could do ultraviolet uh, photoelectrospectroscopy and has an electron gun and probably can do OYE. I mean, you can do OYE with X, with X ray source, but electron gun. Electron guns might be used for OYE as well as X ray source, but also electron guns sometimes they use uh, low energy electron bolts, electron gun, probably five elect uh, electron volt energy, very low energy. And it's just to compensate for the charge that is formed on the surface. Remember that you want to connect the sample to uh, to ground so that you have, uh, you have, uh, so electrons can come from, from ground to compensate for the charge that is being formed here because you're getting electrons out and out. So you have electrons from ground coming into the sample. But if that's not enough, then you can have a electron gun with low energy to just, you know, dip or make a uh, splash of low electron, uh, low ele ele energy electrons to the surface to compensate for the charge. And that helps. So some instruments have that as well. These other parts I'm not going to talk about, but they are part of the uh, electron analyzer the multi-channel detector, the multi-channel analyzer, and some filters uh, because of time. So X-ray source are, are uh, I mean, you have X-ray source for the synchrotron, um, and you saw that uh, previously with Professor uh, Joel Brock. But they, these are sort of the X-ray source that are more common. This is the dual anode source, these two. Uh, and here you have two anodes, uh, magnesium or aluminum, and you have a, uh, a electron a wire uh, that is heated up. So it's in, uh, you pass current through the wire. So you have uh, electron emission from the wire and you apply a voltage between the filament and the uh, anode. And that filament will hit the, uh, like it appears here, the filament that is basically here is heated up. You're heating the, the uh, it's like a uh, condensed uh, light bulbs uh, where it has a, a wire. So um, you have emission of electrons, but then you apply a, between this, uh, this, between this wire and the anode, you, you apply a voltage. I mean, it could be higher than three kilovolts, for example. And that it depend, depending on the, uh, on the energy will be the emission. And then those electrons collide with the sample, and then you have emissions of X-rays. And that's what you see here, emissions of X-rays. So you have a small window here to protect your, your uh, anodes and X-ray source. Um, obviously this aluminum window can absorb X-rays. So, so, so you say, well, what's, what do you get here? Well, if the energy of the electron is not enough to remove an internal electron of magnesium or aluminum, you will have, uh, so this is lambda and this is intensity. you will have something like this. That's uh, what is called Bremsstrahlung radiation or, or white radiation. So uh, in this case, energy is increasing in that direction. And lambda is increasing in that direction. So this is higher energy, lower energy. So this is called uh, Bremsstrahlung radiation or white radiation. And what's this Bremsstrahlung or white radiation? Basically, it's due to the, to the vector 
of transport of electrons on the solid, when it changes direction in, inside the solid, it emits radiation. So it's similar to the synchrotron. You know that synchrotron, they have high energy electrons on a circle and they going around. And every time they change direction, uh, the vector of direction, they have emission. It's basically the same constant. So you have a continuous uh, radiation. If you increase the energy, so if you increase the energy, this will come higher energy. Maybe that energy is enough to remove an internal electron. Then you have these huge transitions, alpha, alpha one and alpha two emission. And that's what you see. So you will see uh, these alpha transitions at high energy. Remember that I told you that, let me put a, a uh, this difference in energy is huge compared to the other ones. So this is the type of transition you will see. You will see uh, you have a white radiation. In addition to that, you have enough energy. In this case, it's 35 kilo electron volts. Then you have this transition, which are huge. And these are the transitions that are really uh, important for the uh, X-ray XPS analysis. So uh, the, uh, the lambda zero, which is this lambda zero, that is the highest lambda, can be calculated with the Dwine Hunt law. Depending on the voltage of acceleration, the charge, you have their uh, Planck's constant. Uh, you can get, uh, you can take this equation to this. So lambda zero is equal to 12,390 divided by the voltage. And you will get the, uh, the um, lambda in Armstrong. So you get the lambda in Armstrong in, and the voltage in volts. So, uh, so that will give you the value. So, so in this case, it's 35,000, 12,300. Somebody can make this calculation. How much is lambda? 12,398. to see if this, if this graph is right, divided by 35,000. So that would be like 0.3 actually. Somebody can do the calculation? Yes, 0.25. 0.25? 0.35. 35, okay. Ah, pues está bien la gráfica. 0.3 is here, so 0.35, it's basically here. So that's the highest, the lowest binding uh, wavelength of photos that you can get. So the, so the Dwayne Hunt law really works. So, so this can give you an, an example of the, of the emission. So, so one of the things that I mentioned, I'm gonna go back a little bit here. Remember that I mentioned that in order to have a, uh, a, a narrower peak full width of maxima, you need to have an X-ray line, the X-ray source, you have the narrowest delta E. And if you look at the delta E of the natural emissions, these are sort of the width, uh, the width, the full half, the full width half maxima of the emission. This is 0 0.47. So this would be ideal, 0 0.47, it's very small. So why don't you get, why don't you use yttrium? They use magnesium and aluminum. It's 0 0.7 and 0 0.85. So it's twice. So why do they, they, they don't use yttrium? They do use magnesium and aluminum. Somebody can tell me? This is the compromise between the energy and the bandwidth. Yeah. So with this energy, there's not much you can excite with 132 electron volts. But with 1.2 and 1.4 kilovolts, there's, uh, you can get very nice spectra of, of many elements. I mean, you can go to 8,000 with copper alpha or chromium alpha, but then you really, uh, your full width half maxi is not very good. 
So that's the, the compromise they have and they select, uh, they have selected this 0 0.7, 0 0.85 as the best one compared to all of this. We say a, a, a reasonable energy for excitation. And that's why they use magnesium and aluminum uh, alpha. And <clears throat> the, the other important thing that you need to uh, understand is that uh, that you have these transitions, ka alpha and ka beta. But <clears throat> for example, this is uh, for magnesium and aluminum. In, in addition to the ka alpha one and two, you have different emissions too. So if you don't have a monochromator, uh, the X-ray source, we have some very small photons coming out from it with different energies. So uh, that will be lower energy. And uh, so uh, they, these photons that are coming out from your X-ray source will excite as well. So you have to be aware of that uh, when you analyze in a spectra, because you might find a very small, very small peak. And it's not really another element. It's basically the same element that you're analyzing, but it was excited with another photon, which is at very low intensity. So here's, for example, this is 100%. If you take like a alpha one, two as 100%, this less than 1%, 2% uh, of photos coming out on, on with different energies for magnesium and aluminum. So uh, this is uh, what I mentioned just uh, previously that if you, uh, if you do, uh, uh, in a spectra this is for copper film uh, and you change from aluminum anode to magnesium anode and you plot versus binding energy basically the copper 2p and copper 3p they don't, don't change they're in the same position obviously but the OJ lines change they move so it's a very simple way to to identify peaks that are not xps if you plot against binding energy. So that's the advantage of using a, a dual anode source with magnesium and aluminum. The disadvantage, one of the, well, the disadvantage is that you have additional peaks that might come up because of these small photons coming out from the X-ray source that are not the main transition. So, uh, so to avoid, to improve the resolution or to, uh, to eliminate, for example, these satellite peaks that might come up from, from these other photons uh, and to just try to select the right energy, you can include a, a crystal, what is called crystal analyzer. So you have your X-ray source and using Bragg's law, that you saw last week with Professor Brock, you will select one energy and that energy is the one that is gonna hit the sample. So uh, here you have probably different lambdas, no? Very narrow, but you will have different lambdas and probably you have here one lambda coming, at least one lambda hitting the sample. So you, um, you, uh, you improve in that aspect the only situation here is that the intensity of photons will be lower because the photons are, 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 are filtered with the crystal analyzer. This is another example. You have an, the electron source. I mean, that is hitting, basically that's inside here. It hits the anode and the anode emits radiation and the quartz crystal that is usually used selects the energy because of the angle, no? That's what we will see. Is the energy that's gonna hit the sample. So, uh, so the crystal analyzer is the one. This has been, uh, this is being elaborated more because they want to increase the uh, resolution. And it's from physical electronics and other companies are doing the same. And instead of using a regular wire uh, to 
create electrons to um, for them to be accelerated to the anode for to have the X-ray emission, uh, they use like a scanning electron gun. So in principle, this part of your anode is like a scanning electron, a SEM, scanning electron microscope. So they are making this uh, beam of electron smaller and smaller having this beam of x-ray smaller and smaller so you will have a smaller uh, a smaller uh, beam size hitting the sample so you have better resolution so you can scan the the beam in different directions and this will move so you can do a in uh, XPS image of your sample. It's still in the uh, micrometer range, but that's very nice, micrometer range for a XPS. So the Bragg law you saw yesterday, how you, you, uh, you select the, uh, the crystal for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, to select the energy. Uh, so uh, Bragg won the Nobel Prize in 1915. So depending on the angle, and uh, this is given for from the crystal, is the lambda that is coming out that will have a constructive interaction. So this constructive interaction that the uh, wave waves are in the same position, it's, it, it's, it happens when you have this relationship that occurs. So uh, you can have uh, a mosaic of crystals and that's to increase the number of photos that can go through. So they create this, what is called the, um, a uh, Roland sphere uh, Johansson construction. So you have like a mosaic of crystals. It's not a uh, one crystal, so it's a number of crystals. Um, there are different crystals that can be used this is a table of, uh, of crystals that are used for uh, wavelengths, wavelength dispersive spectroscopy for X-ray fluorescence. So depending on the, on the crystal, is the range of energies that you can use or lambda that you can uh, detect. Here, for example, if you use lithium fluoride, it can go from potassium to uh, indium with good resolution. And these are Ka alpha and Ka alpha of uh, emission. And they're synthetic crystals like lead stearate. And the uh, 2D is like 10 nanometers, which is huge. And this is to look at small, uh, low uh, atomic number elements. Here is, for example, for boron, uh, for the emission that you can detect. For the XPS, they use a quartz crystal, a quartz crystal, yeah, a silicon dioxide, and uh, and that's enough for for the magnesium, uh, for the uh, for the aluminum alpha uh, emission. So these are different emissions that the quartz crystal can really uh, filter. Uh, it can do aluminum alpha. Uh, silver L alpha, titanium K alpha, and chromium K beta. This can be filtered with this crystal. So uh, the crystal is used to filter, uh, to have a monochromatic X-ray is the, uh, the quartz crystal. Uh, and the lambda uh, that goes through uh, in a constructive way following a Bragg's law is the uh, K alpha of aluminum which has a, a lambda of 0.83 nanometers, 8.3 angstroms. And, uh, and here this tells you the, the crystal uh, uh, spacing of the quartz, and this will be the angle, the Bragg angle that is being used to do that. So this is fixed. Uh, the monochromated X-ray source has a fixed quartz crystal with a fixed angle between the uh, uh, X-ray source and your sample. Uh, 
this area, uh, this is very important uh, here that I have not talked about, uh, but now and then you need to do a bakeout of your system just to purify the interior of your chamber. And this is just telling you that you cannot hit this whole system more than 100 degrees C because you will destroy the uh, crystal. So you have to be very careful when you do that, uh, baking out of your, uh, of your system. So here are, these are two, uh, this is a comparison between a monochromated source, a non-monochromated and a monochromated source. Um, the non-monochromated is here, is the wider one, wider peaks. And it has some satellite peaks, as you can see here. That's one, two, and three. This is uh, a for a, a spectra of the four three D spectra. Uh, when you use a monochromatic source, is uh, is thinner. The field will, full width half maxima is much better. And you don't see these peaks because those photons didn't go through the quartz. They were removed. Only the, uh, the K alpha uh, of aluminum went through and that's the only one that excited the sample. The other photons didn't excite. So these peaks are, are satellite peaks that appear and this is a uh, you have also a higher uh, background, and that's because of the Bremsstrahlung radiation. Remember that this radiation also, this radiation, the Bremsstrahlung radiation is also hitting your sample in a polychromatic X-ray source, in a dual anode an X-ray source. But when you filter your, your X-rays, then those background white radiation doesn't hit your sample. So you have also uh, other electrons being produced because they were excited with all different X-ray energies. So that's why the background is higher. So for example, this is a, a satellite peak, X-ray satellite peak. So the difference between this peak and this one is how much? It's... Uh, Two electron volts? No, cuatro. It's four, no, no, two, yeah, 60. It's like two electron volts. Difference between this peak and this peak, is that right? So if you go to this table, it doesn't appear here. So, <laughs> so it might be higher. Let's see. So this might be, uh, this will be four. This is four and this is eight. Four and eight. So the difference here is five and nine. It's the difference. So you will have uh, lower binding energies because of that photons. So this might be related to this peak. Let's see, this is two, four, is uh, four, six, eight. Eight something here. This will be, uh, so this will, this will be uh, eight. This will be like uh, 10. And this, with respect to this one, no? If you put this as zero and compare this one to this one, this will be eight, 10, and this will be uh, 16. Is that right? No, oh, this is 74, 14. The difference between here and here is uh, around 14 electron volts. This one is like 10 and this one is like eight electron volts. 
And if you go <clears throat> to this table, this probably 10 will be this one. This is a little bit higher, 19 and 10 and four. So these photons that are here identified might be the photons that cause these excitations of these electrons. And they might, might be related to this one. I'm not sure if they're related to this one or not, but these are other photons that excited the electron, internal electrons. But when you do the calculation, you use the main energy of the, uh, the X-ray source. So they are out, they're off by those amount of uh, uh, electron volts. So the bottom line here is that if you use a monochromated source, the peaks are much narrower and background is much lower. This peak here uh, and this one here might be a what is known a shake up. That, oops, it's called, well, I'll talk about that just in a moment. Shake up peaks. Those are shake up peaks. This one, this peak is related to this one and this is related to this one. So the difference here, it's around four uh, electron volts and here it's more or less the same, four electron volts. Those are shape of cup transitions. And I'll talk about this, uh, this uh, <clears throat> soon. So what, what is the disadvantage of using a monochromator? Well, for sure is that you're gonna have less photons hitting your sample. So the flux of photons will be lower because you, you're basically like filtering the X-ray source. <clears throat> so uh, not all the X-rays generated in the anode are gonna reach your sample. So that's a uh, disadvantage. Uh, you can, to, to improve that, you can uh, do a couple of things, increase the power, which will make the uh, lifetime of your source uh, lower. They use rotating anodes, it's another way of doing it. Uh, they use the, uh, the mosaic of crystals that I told you, that you can have like a mosaic of crystal to do this type of, uh, of enhance of photons that can be, uh, go through the uh, monochromator to uh, hit your sample. And the other thing is to use a higher intensity source. It, you can use a secretron source uh, as you have in chess. So, the, uh, so that's for the x-ray sources or the x-ray source. The analyzers are very simple. I mean, they are concentric uh, uh, tubes. This is called cylindrical mural analyzer. So you have a uh, so you have an internal uh, tube and an external tube, and basically you apply a voltage between these two. Uh, between that elect tube and this one, so you will change the voltage with time and depending on the voltage between these two tubes will be the electron that is gonna be able to reach the detector at the end. <clears throat> uh, if the, uh, in this case, if you maintain this voltage, if the kinetic energy is larger than the uh, kinetic energy that is allowed to reach the detector, the those electrons with higher kinetic energy will hit the uh, external tube those electrons that have lower energy, kinetic energy, will hit the internal tube. And only the ones that have the proper kinetic energy will, be, will reach the detector. So you are basically making, uh, changing the voltage with time. So you are losing electrons in this process, but you are analyzing the exact kinetic energy that you want to analyze to make the spectra. So this uh, sort of the same. Uh, so the uh, so here's sort of uh, an equation that you can use to determine the kinetic energy 
that you are analyzing. This is the voltage. This is the radius R2 and R1 with respect to the center. So this will be R1. And this will be R2. So if you know these values from your uh, from your uh, instrument, you can determine the voltage. Uh, will determine the energy, kinetic energy that can be detected. In this uh, cylindrical mirror analyzer, uh, it has a magnetic field, a magnetic shield. Uh, these to protect the analyzer from magne external magnetic fields. Because if you have magnetic fields, it's gonna affect the trajectory of the electrons as well. So you have to, well, so you, when you install one of these instruments in your laboratory or facility, uh, the technicians will measure the magnetic field and probably the vibration if you're using the Oye and Micropro. But the magnetic field is a very important parameter that has to be uh, measured to avoid any interference. So, but in addition to that, they have a, it has a shield to protect. In this design, they have the X-ray source and they have an electron gun aligned with this cylindrical mirror analyzer. And this electron gun is used for OYE, OYE electron spectroscopy and scanning OYE, my, micro probe and nano probe. And it's aligned very nicely with the uh, analyzer. And the X-ray is basically for XPS. I mean, you can do XPS with the electron analyzer, but the error of the energy of the electron gun is very large. So the full width half maxima of your peaks in, uh, in the spectra are gonna be wider with you with an electron gun source compared to an X-ray source. So that's why you use the X-ray source for XPS. Then you have a, the hemispherical analyzer. Uh, questions? Me oyen? Sí. Okay. This is the other uh, analyzer, it's hemispheric. It's the same, the same process as this uh, cylindrical mirror analyzer. I mean, only it's hemispherical. This has a more um, uh, throughput of electrons than the cylindrical mirror analyzer. So in general, it's a better analyzer. And this is a, a picture of, of an analyzer. So it's concentric uh, uh, hemispheres. So you have, uh, so, uh, so if you put this, this will be R1 as the one before, and this will be R2. And this, you will apply a voltage between those two plates, this one and this one. So you apply a voltage and only the ones that have the proper kinetic energy will go through the concentric plates and hit the detector. So it's basically the same concept. So the, uh, this is a schematic of a, uh, uh, it's in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, poly, uh, monochromatic X-ray source polychromatic X-ray source, the hemispherical analyzer. It has uh, uh, vacuum pumps, tubo molecular pumps, and the ion pump, and the sublimator, the, um, uh, the spotter. So it has three, at least three, actually it has four pumps. But the ones that are really used are these, these three. Uh, this, this turbo molecular, the diffusion pumps, and the uh, and the ion pump. And these pumps, these two are connected to the pre-chamber where you put your, your sample. So it's uh, the instrument that we have uh, in the Molecular Science Research Center. It's from the 90s and it still works like a gem. 
So you here you have, this is the uh, polychromatic source and here is the monochromatic. So here is the X-ray source. Here is the crystal, the quartz crystal. And then the X-rays go to your sample, which are in, in the middle. So this is the monochromatic source. So the crystal is here. So you need to um, make the right angle to select the right wavelength. Back here is the hemispherical analyzer. This is the hemispherical analyzer. This area here is uh, the ion gun. So it has different uh, gases, as helium, uh, argon, and um, it also has oxygen. And oxygen is used also for XPS to, uh, for some, some uh, for SIMS, sorry, for SIMS to enhance some sputtering yields. But anyway, you can use uh, helium to do ion scattering spectroscopy and argon to do sputtering just to remove the surface. So that's why you have several um, gases in this system. And back here is a, uh, a mass spectrometer, actually. So you can do mass spectrometry. And here is where you put your sample. So that's a measure from the front. So here is the, uh, this is the antechamber where you put your sample. So it's something like this. So you remove this lid and you put your sample inside a holder. And then when the vacuum is 10 to the minus six tor, then you move your rod with your sample and you put it inside the chamber. And you can see here is that this is the holder for your sample. So there's the sample is in a holder. That hold, holder will click here. And then you remove the uh, rod and your sample will stay here. W one of the things is that, uh, that you see here is that this sort of your chamber, all of the uh, X-ray source, uh, analyzers, ion goals, they are concentric. They are all uh, looking into the same spot on your sample. So that's very important. So you have all aligned to one point on, on your surface. And that's why they are looking, it's, it's a round chamber and everything is looking inside. So again, this is the monochromator. So you have the X-ray source here, the crystal is here, and then basically the X-rays will hit your sample. This is the polychromatic. One thing that I didn't mention is that um, the X-ray emission is not very efficient. So when you hit with electrons your anode in the X-ray source, much of the energy is released as heat. So in order to avoid the uh, anode aluminum or la anode magnesium to melt, literally to melt, you need to cool it. So you have a cooling system. This is basically water cooling system and uh, you cool your anode. Here you have a cooling system too, somewhere here. You see the, the pipes? There are two pipes here. That's for a cooling system and that's for the cooling system. If you don't do that, then you might have an accident in your system because the um, source might, uh, might melt and, and you have uh, water coming in and it will be a complete mess. The other thing that happens here, and, and you need to be aware that if this is your, let's say that this is aluminum, and here you're hitting this with electrons, and this is uh, giving away photons, and back here you have your, your cooling system. and they try to use the ionized water and you cool the water and it goes in this direction. Uh, the other thing that you have to be at, so this is inside the chamber, remember, it's sort of in the chamber. This is in ultra high vacuum. 
So you can imagine all of this is in ultra high vacuum and this is in one atmosphere. This 10 to the mi minus 10 door. So if this melts, water will go in. But the other thing that happens is that with time, you have a removal of some of the aluminum because of water. So uh, it's, not by, it's not huge, but you have to be careful because, it, I mean, you have to check your anode um, every couple of years to be sure that it's okay. If not, you need to remove your anode because this might, uh, uh, sample is re being removed from your anode because of the water flux. And it might happen that it could go down here and water will go in too. So, so that's, that's something that you have to be careful. Is a hemispherical analyzer and uh, you see here that uh, they have the, this is an NMR. So we had our XPS near an NMR, but the new NMRs they're shielding is, is excellent. So the magnetic fields decay very fast with distance. So the, that didn't affect our XPS. So, uh, so that, was, that was good. This was in the first floor of the molecular science building. Now it's in the fourth floor, uh, the XPS. These are commercial X XPS that you can uh, buy. These are sort of uh, automatic. It costs like a million dollars. Uh, the Quantera, we have an old Quanta like this one from the uh, it's 2000 that was bought by Hewlett Packard and uh, Jorge Colon, Jorge and Colon, no, <laughs> Jorge Garcia, Orozco, which was my student, uh, bought it at, at HP in Aguadilla. It's in the west side of Puerto Rico. But then Hewlett Packard didn't, ha didn't need it anymore, so he gave it away. He, uh, a present and he called me, hey, do you want an XPS? I said, why not? So we paid for the trucking and we installed it upstairs in the molecular science building. Actually, we installed it in Facundo West first, but it works nice. He said, the only thing is too automatic. And when too automatic means uh, the, uh, you have to uh, need to have a uh, good uh, computer interaction with the C uh, because everything is controlled with the computer, so. But I mean, again, if you can take a space a spaceship like SpaceX to the uh, to the International Space Station and everything was computerized, as you could see the screens of the astronauts, I mean, this should be able to to work properly. So yeah, it's important to do the maintenance and upgrades, and, and you have to invest on this instrument now and then. Okay. So we have a couple of uh, more minutes. Uh, five minutes? Can we take a five minute break? Yeah. Okay. Uh, could do that at 10.50. See. So I'm gonna talk to you about the XP, XPX spectra, what you can observe and, and we'll finish there. Okay? Thanks. Bimari, are you there? Yes, I'll start recording again. Okay, so so I'm gonna <clears throat> what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, things that you can observe in the spectra. So I'm go oops, qué pasó aquí? Oh, there we go. So you saw this thing. I'm gonna go back a little bit so to uh, an example of a nice XPS spectra. Silver, for example. So you have this was, it, uh, it's really um, <laughs> messy right now, but you know, you have a spectra for silver, but there, um, so you need to have a sharp eye when you analyze uh, XPS data. Uh, and uh, it's important because sometimes you send, your sample somewhere, you don't have the XPS and they'll send you the spectra back and they will analyze it for you, but you should analyze it as well. And there are softwares to analyze spectras available. 
uh, the instrument has a software, but there is a commercial uh, uh, software for, for this uh, analysis. But anyway, so <clears throat> these are sort of uh, things that you will see in an spectra. And uh, this, this one are related to what we mentioned, the Delta E and the photomission peak that you're gonna see. And we mentioned also the satellite peaks. If you don't have a monochromated source, you will have some satellite peaks that are related to other photons that are not the main photon of the X-ray source. So uh, if you have a monochromator, you don't see these peaks, but if you don't have one, and which is in most of the cases, you don't have, you don't have one, it's more expensive to have a monochromator than having a dual anode source. Then you have the Chekhov and Chekhov satellites that I'm going to talk about. Obviously, you have the OJ lines. We saw that already, that you saw some OJ transitions. There is some inelastic scattering, balanced band features that I mentioned. Uh, the spin orbit coupling that you will have two peaks for S, P, and D. A multiple splitting that I'm going to show you that, that this has to do with the spin of the electron that is coming out and how the spin, total spin of your atom or molecule ends up. And some plasmon uh, peaks and I'll show you that as well. So, uh, so this is sort of balance band uh, level. They, are, they have very uh, small binding energy and I'll show you that previously that it's really almost uh, in the Fermi level. So it's the, from zero to 20 electron volts binding energy. That's called the balance band uh, region. And this can give you a structure. If it's a metal, you don't see much information, but if you have a polymer, a molecule, uh, something more complex, uh, you can see some structure. And you can say if you have a semiconductor, in principle, you will be able to see uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, balance band and conduction band density of states. It's like a density of state uh, uh, <clears throat> analysis. So so this is a, uh, a uh, an example of uh, a carbon electrode. It's a carbon fiber uh, before and after electrochemical treatment. So basically, they are trying to oxidize the carbon. So you can see here that this is one electron volt, uh, one volt apl applied in an electrochemical cell in acid, up to three volts. So in this direction, you're increasing the oxidation of the carbon. So if you increase the oxidation of the carbon, you will have more carbon functionalities on the electron. So, uh, so here is what you see uh, a spectra, it's an overall spectra. So you see mainly the carbon 1S, peak. When you start to oxidize the carbon, you start to see the oxygen 1s peak here. So this is the oxygen 1s peak formation, which is clearly you that you are oxidizing the carbon fiber. So when you look closer in binding energy regions, this is a, um, a, um, a we call it a survey. And here's when you're in the binding energy region. Uh, values for the carbon 1s, you see that you basically see one peak. But when you start to oxidize, you, see, you start to see these shoulders. And that shoulder basically increases enormously. And these are basically oxides, carbon oxide formation. And this is incredible that you are basically, remember you're oxidizing the carbon fiber. It's the oxidation occurs on the outside of the fiber. So you have an, a, a fiber of this form so you're forming an oxide on the fiber. You still have the carbon inside, pure carbon. But since this is a surface analysis instrument technique, you're looking at the surface of the fiber. So you're basically looking at the oxide formation. And this is very li nicely seen here in the carbon 1x uh, binding energy. The oxygen uh, also changes with time. And oxygen, oxygen uh, basically you're seeing basically the one type of functionality here. Here you have like two functionalities. 
Uh, I don't like oxygen too much. <laughs> one is sometimes it's difficult to observe, but here you can see that you have like one oxide formation. Uh, you see only one peak, maybe it's one type of oxide or with carbon that you're forming. The other part that is very interesting on this is the balance band that is close to zero, the binding energy, remember? And this gives you more information on the balance band. This is basically uh, the external bands of the carbon. And you can see how it changes when you form the oxides. It has more structure. And this is basically can be uh, modeled as a density of state with the different levels, external levels of the, of the molecules that you're forming. So here you can see very uh, defined peaks that may be defined levels on your system, probably uh, highest occupied molecular orbital or, or uh, other levels in your system. And here is basically doing X-ray diffraction to see that you're forming other things in the crystal on the fiber. So, so you can follow this very nicely with XPS. So here you, what you do is you put your fiber in the electrochemical cell, you oxidize, then you remove it and put it in the UHV system and analyze it. Obviously it cannot have water, so it has to be dried and uh, vacuumed and then analyzed. So uh, there, are, uh, there are handbooks, actually physical electronics has a handbook of balance band spectroscopy of polymers. So uh, this is sort of, uh, uh, these are calculated, this is the real one, but you can, you can use your balance band spectra and with uh, spectras of different polymers, you can de determine the concentration of each polymer. So it's like a fingerprint uh, of, of the different polymers and when you combine, for example, the calculator for this polymer and this polymer, and you produce this balance band spectra, it's pretty close to the spectra that you see. So you can, in principle, identify polymers by looking at the balance band spectra. Remember, it's pretty close to zero. So here's uh, 10, so this will be, uh, this will be minus four, I guess. So the minus ocho, minus eight. Yeah, so this will be uh, five minus one. So zero should be like here. So, so those are the balance band that I mentioned. The secondary structures are, are sort of the X-ray satellite piece that I mentioned before, uh, multiple splitting that has to do with spin, some shake up and shake off and uh, I'll mention what that means and, and some uh, structure information. So multiple splitting is basically uh, the concept that, uh, that you have different spins on your, uh, on your atom. Uh, and that is very uh, nicely seen uh, with paramagnetic uh, uh, systems. And, and it will depend on the final state uh, of your uh, uh, atom when you remove a photoelectron. When you remove a photoelectron of 3s of manganese plus two, what it's saying here is that you have two final states. And that means uh, uh, how the electrons are, are uh, aligned. It could be, um, uh, higher spin or lower spin. And uh, you can determine that and, and uh, I'm not gonna go over this very uh, strongly, but you can see a difference, for example, uh, this ratio is around uh, because of the spin before and after, it's like 1.4. You can see a change of 13 electron volts from, uh, from the uh, 3S electron. So uh, meaning that if you have this 3S electron level where you have two spins, minus one half and plus one half, it's not the same 
removing the binding energy of this electron is different than the binding energy of this electron. They are not the same. And that's impressive. And it's because the final state that you uh, achieve have a different uh, 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 total speed. And that affects how easy or less easy is to remove an electron with a certain spin. And here is an example for chromium. Uh, in this one is a chromium hexacarbonyl. It doesn't have no unpaired electrons. So that doesn't affect the total spin of uh, the system is basically zero, um, sorry. So, uh, so you see one peak only. So you see basically one peak. If you have two unpaired electrons, so meaning that in some level, D level, you have two unpaired electrons. So the total of the spin here will be equal to one. Let's assume this one. If you are going to remove an electron, internal electron from uh, the S level, it's not the same as removing this one than removing this one. If you remove this one, if you remove this one, your spin, total spin will be one and a half. If you remove this one, the total spin will be one half. So uh, that difference in spin causes a difference in binding energy. And you see two peaks for the 1s. And if you have three unpaired electrons, which is in this complex uh, of chromium, the difference in binding energy of the 1s is higher. So it's very easy for you to see if it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic system that you are analyzing. Then the Chekhov and Chekhov, uh, I need to make a picture here. You have to, uh, the Chekhov process is really associated with um, uh, P2P transition meaning that uh, that if you have a, uh, for example, this is from the 1S level, and you have another level here, which could be the HOMO, and a higher level that is a LOMO, and you hit the this system with, X-rays, this internal electron will really go out with a kinetic energy. So this electron has a kinetic energy. But what happens? <clears throat> it could happen that some part of that kinetic energy can be used to move this ele electron to a higher le level. They could be from P to P star. So meaning that this electron has a lower energy than the electrons that don't produce Chekhov. So uh, I'm gonna put here a star because that electron really has given part of its energy to have this transition, P, P, P to P star. And that's called shake-up satellite peaks. So what do you what you will see if you have a uh, let's see if I have a picture here. This is a sort of uh, these are binding energies for uh, Syria. The three D level it appears at nine o two, and this is. Again, this is in kinetic energy, so I cannot say much about it. It's not in binding energy, so this doesn't work. But these are these two peaks. So this is the main peak. 
and this is the second piece. So you will have, uh, uh, this will be 2P, uh, 3D, uh, 3 halves, uh, 3D, uh, 5 halves, and 3D, uh, 3 half will be this one. All these peaks, additional peaks here, here, and here, 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 and here, are Jacob transitions. So they are satellite peaks. And this is a very uh, high atomic number uh, element, and we have a lot of levels. So you will have those transitions. So, so this electron may lose energy because of this transition, this transition, or this transition. The, the, bu the beauty of this uh, spectra is that this is quantized transitions. So you can, in principle, see the difference in energy between the different levels. Because the difference between this peak and this peak is a uh, difference in two electron, uh, electronic levels of, your, of Syria. And if you look at the difference in peaks in energy between these two peaks, that's the difference between two levels. And so you can have a, 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 to, a to a certain point, you can have some information on the electronic levels of, of Syria. So uh, external levels, obviously, external levels of Syria that are where the Chekhov transition occurs. So that's, that's sort of uh, impressive. Uh, so here's an example of uh, Jacob transitions and multiplex, uh, este, multiplex splitting. So this is copper two and copper two has very unique satellite peaks, Jacob peaks for copper 2p3 halves and copper 2p1 half. And this is so impressive that for copper one or copper zero, you don't see those peaks. So again, this, these peaks are a fingerprint of copper two. You can really easily determine that it's copper two by looking at an, a, a copper two P binding energy region for a copper sample. In this case, it's copper oxide. Nickel, it's paramagnetic and it's nickel oxide. So you have you have multiple splitting for the 2p3 half. So you have two peaks here and two peaks here. That's why it's wider for the multiple splitting. And then you have Jacob satellites in addition. So you have one satellite here that is associated to those. And it's wide because you might have two peaks similar to this one. And the thing the same thing happens here. This one is related to this one, and this one is related to this one. So, so you can think that doing a nickel analysis, uh, you will see two peaks, and here you see basically, if you take this as two peaks and these two peaks, it will two, four, six, eight peaks instead of two, and you can think that this might be another element or or another or impurity. But in reality, they are all related to nickel. And it's for aluminum, and it happens with metals. And, and this is uh, uh, the 2P signal, which you should have two peaks, but you see only one. There is a shoulder here. But then you have this plasmon. This is like a, uh, a Jacob but it's a plasma is that you are exciting the, uh, the electron cloud on the aluminum. That's basically in the conduction band. Those electron clouds can be excited. And that, so the electron of 2P excited the plasma. So these are electrons of 2P electrons, but they lost this energy because that energy was used to excite the plasmons on the aluminum. In addition to that, you have an OJ line, KLL, 
that I'll explain tomorrow what is that. It's an oil line. And in addition, there is a satellite peak from the X-ray source because this photon, Ka alpha 3 and 4, excited the 2p electron. But since this is calculated with the Ka alpha 1 and 2, then you are basically looking at, uh, you are not uh, calculating properly the binding energy. So, uh, so this other peak here is a satellite due to the X-ray source. If you have a monochromator, you won't see this. But if you have a polychromated source, a dual anode source, you will see a you will see satellites now and then, because because of the X-ray source. So this is sort of. Uh, the things that you can see here's another another peak for uh, for uh, aluminum. This is a 2s for aluminum, which is here. Aluminum zero. If you have an oxide, you have a lower a higher binding energy of 2s, but then you have these plasmons, and you have like two plasmons and. It might be that you have plasmons for this electron and for this electron. So you have plasmon one, plasmon two, plasmon three. So it's basically, uh, uh, these are basically excitations, different type of excitation of the uh, electron cloud, external electron cloud of the conduction band of aluminum. So those plasmons are basically seen in metals uh, in general, at, uh, in some metals, not all of them, but in aluminum, is uh, sometimes seen as is shown here. So these electrons that are being detected are 2s electrons, but they lost energy. And that energy was used to excite the plasmons of, uh, of aluminum. Here is a spectra of, uh, of, uh, of a polymer. And here you have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Here you have an Oye line force oxygen and the balanced band spectra is down here near zero. So if you look closer to the carbon 1s, you can see the different functionalities. I, uh, these are sort of the hydrocarbon, the uh, carbon with oxygen and nitrogen. And here you have carbon with nitrogen and oxygen. And here you have a satellite peak, that's a checkup due to a PP transition. So the uh, the structure of the carbon 1s can can, oops, can give you uh, a very nice information on the functionalities of the carbon. And here you see two carbon oxygen peaks. And this is basically uh, this is one oxygen, and this is the other oxygen. They are bonded to different things. This is basically a double bond to carbon. And here's a single bond to carbon. So you can see difference in the oxygen 1s peak. The nitrogen is only one peak and basically you have only one nitrogen. This one is the same to this one. So there's not much difference. So, uh, so this polymer, you can really analyze it very nicely by XPS and get some information on the structure. Uh, you can do some care fitting, and the, uh, there's some softwares for that. Uh, if you need information on the software, you can let us know, and we could get get you some information. Actually, we have access to CASAS, I think. We have the license, of UPR license, and you can use that. If, uh, so this is sort of looking at the molybdenum 3D level. And... Uh, and this is the uh, three, the molybdenum zero 3D are these two peaks. These are the oxides, 3D molybdenum six 3D. And then you have argon here because this was spotted with argon. So you have argon, although the argon is used to remove layers of your sample, it can also penetrate and, uh, and stay in, the, in your 
in your solid and you will see argon. So, so you see 2p one half and 2p three halves. And here, somewhere here, you see these two peaks. And this is Ka alpha three four, three four of the argon two peaks. So these are these peaks, but they are, they were excited with two different, uh, with the uh, Ka alpha three four photons of the X-ray source. So this is a polychromatic source. So the curve fitting gets more complicated uh, as you have uh, polychromatic. So, so you have to be careful how you analyze the spectra. So here's molybdenum. So this is molybdenum is 231. It's here. And 227, somewhere here. So it's for molybdenum zero. When you oxidize, then it goes higher in energy. And argon is in 250, 248. Well, that's not right, huh? Argon is 248 and 250. Well, you get 248. So this is probably due to the oxides. This has moved to your, toward, well, actually the other way around. It's lower binding energy. That's interesting. Anyway, so it's lower binding energy for the argon. Hmm. Well, anyway, so uh, so if you look in different, uh, in the periodic table, the different elements uh, uh, in one row, basically they move in energy. I mean, this is for the uh, L1, that's 2S, one half, how the binding energy changes. So uh, that's clearly easy to identify elements. And the same is true with uh, transition metals. Uh, they change uh, binding energies depending on the uh, on the element. Uh, uh, so it's very easy to to identify uh, elements. Uh, it gets complicated when you have a multi-element sample, but for one or two elements, that's quite simple to do. Uh, I showed this before. The binding energy changes with uh, with uh, with atomic number. So uh, the cross section I showed before, the cross section is different, but the binding energy also changes depending on the element is the binding energy. So the level K one S one half changes with atomic number. So as you increase the, uh, uh, you increase the atomic number, uh, the binding energies are higher for the K level, L level, M and N, uh, different N, and levels as well. So as you increase the uh, atomic number, the binding energy increases. So <clears throat> you can follow that very easily. You can follow this by this a sample that was a nickel silicon sample. As you increase the, uh, the temperature, so you're basically increasing the, uh, the diffusion of nickel to silicon with time. So here is basically when you have only nickel, uh, nickel silicon separated. So it's a nickel signal. But as you increase the uh, the interaction of silicon in nickel, then the uh, binding energy of nickel changes. So you can follow this by XPS, and uh, and you can heat your sample and see what happens. So you can have a heating stage in your XPS to this experiment. So, uh, so I think I'm gonna end here, uh, and I'm gonna talk tomorrow about OJ. I am, I'm only going to show you one slide. Is this slide? Is that <clears throat> XPS is uh, really uh, moving into in operando and in situ analysis? for electrochemical uh, devices. And this is an example of uh, one of the papers that you have an electrochemical cell and you have a very small window of silicon. 
So you can so, see the uh, reaction on the electrode surface, but you're heating in this case uh, with x-rays your sample through the back and then looking at the photoelectrons. For this type of uh, analysis, you can imagine that you need to use a, a synchrotron source and since electrons have to pass thicker uh, barriers, you might be looking at XPS signals of, of a high energy XPS that can transport through a film. And this is it's a beautiful experiment. And this has been done at uh, different synchrotron sources around the world. And Brookhaven is doing this. And, and I think Lawrence Berkeley, and they have been pioneers on doing XPS in operando in situ. And they have gone to prepare small grids uh, like this with uh, graphene layers. Uh, so that you have a smaller layer uh, barrier. And this is sort of a, a beautiful experiment as well. And uh, these are sort of uh, uh, other experiments that are done with uh, UHV system. Anyway, I like the graphene part. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna end here and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. <clears throat> Is that okay, Limari? It's okay with me. It's 11.23. So I'll, uh, I'll, if you have any questions, if not, then I'll see you all tomorrow. If, if there's any question, if you don't want to ask the questions here, you can write an email with uh, the question you may you may have. And I'm going to write down my email in the chat. So if you don't get that, if you don't get the, the presentation, please send me an email and I will send them to you. <clears throat> Have a question, Marge? <laughs> okay, I think that's that's it for.